USC students want to know how DPS spends its multi-million dollar budget. Find out why they're demanding change. The new Secretary of Interior is the first Native American woman in history to join the U.S. cabinet. See how a USC student from the same Pueblo tribe feels about the confirmation. And the Vatican speaks out on same-sex marriage. See why this decision is a disappointment to many Catholics around the world. Live from USC, you're watching Annenberg TV News. Tonight, there is disappointment among Catholics over the Vatican's refusal to bless same-sex marriage. Good evening, I'm Noah Cameras reporting from Los Angeles. And I'm Kimberly Guest, also reporting from LA. Although the church welcomes gay people, the Vatican says, quote, God cannot bless sins. The message was approved by Pope Francis. In 2019, he supported granting gay couples legal protections in the civil sphere, but not in the church. This decision sheds light on the national and international split over the acceptance of same-sex marriage. I was born and raised Catholic, and speaking from my perspective, I had to make the decision to transfer. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I consider myself any religious affiliation at this point. I think it's complicated, and it's complicated for a lot of queer students who are undergoing this stress and anxiety of having the church not support you. There's been misinformation spread even within the Catholic Church. It's interesting because I think like as a Catholic, um, this is not like new news. But in reality, um, he he's made like basically the same exact statements before. And I think the reason why it's big news now is because that last year there was like a documentary released on uh, like the focusing on, on, on him. And so that just got more press attention and it's just like big news now. According to the Pew Research Center, 61% of Catholics in the U.S. support same-sex marriage. Mainline Protestants share similar views, but less than one third of white evangelical Protestants approve. I think one of the things that uh, most people who follow the American press miss is the global context within which the church operates. We have a tendency to contract everything to the United States. So if someone who is part of the Catholic community is watching all this, I think it's really crucial for them to try to find the best understanding and information of what's really going on. You, you should be very dedicated to trying to find out all sides of a story. And even if some people are very disappointed, there are a lot of other people that are very relieved. This decision upset many members of the LGBTQ plus community. Elton John criticized the Vatican for refusing to bless same-sex marriage even though the church invested in his film, Rocket Man. Two newly elected USG senators want students to have more of a say in how the DPS budget is allocated. They believe the first step is transparency from the university. We want to be able to say that when we look at DPS budgeting, when we look at how we spend money as an institution, that students and communities are part of that conversation. And that we're not, one, assuming the needs and desires of students and um, communities of color, and two, that we're including them. This is what the school's spending money on as opposed to these other sort of, I guess, student needs or, um, you know, community revitalization efforts, which I would argue are more important than um, investing in public safety, because if you address the causes of why crime increases in these areas by investing in community resources and strengthening, um, you know, support for students, then that in turn will make public safety less necessary. While some advocate for gradually defunding DPS, others believe that disbanding the police entirely is the only way to assure campus safety. USC Forward is a coalition of students, alumni, and community members who advocate for abolishing campus police. Our demands are for them to disband, to abolish the University Department of so-called Public Safety, the USC Police Force, as we call it. You know, we, we want them to invest part of that, two, that $50 million. We'll cut that right in half, $25 million for scholarships for LA Unified School District graduates to attend USC, and then another 25 to start an affordable housing land trust for the community that the community can now buy back. 
because we need to, to, to save affordable housing in Los Angeles. A member of the Reimagining Public Safety Coalition released this statement. Quote, USC DPS and policing creates racist and classist violence for the community, not safety. USC DPS must be abolished in favor of community-led transformative justice. And to achieve abolition, we need a community-led abolition commission instead of the community advisory board. An investigation of USC's Department of Public Safety published last month led to protests to abolish DPS. The report, published by Newsweek and Capital in Maine, said DPS has hired several officers who were investigated by the LAPD for misconduct. USC Media Relations provided this statement to Annenberg Media. Quote, consistent with statewide standards, DPS conducts an extensive background check for individuals who apply for armed officer positions, end quote. They did not comment on issues regarding budget reallocation or disbanding campus police. I think it's a really smart way to kind of expose the, the relationship between the USC administration and DPS. It's been a very problematic relationship for a long time, and a lot of students of color have repeatedly voiced their concerns about the disproportionate policing and targeting of Black students on campus. Last fall, USC created a community advisory board to examine campus public safety practices. Members encourage community input. Suggestions can be submitted at dpscab.usc.edu forward slash provide dash input. It's as symbolic as it is historic. Deb Holland, a member of New Mexico's Laguna Pueblo tribe, has become the first Native American cabinet secretary in U.S. history. I'm Emily Bonilla, reporting from Altadena. The selection of Holland to lead the Department of the Interior brings history full circle. The agency manages over 5 million acres of public land, much of it seized from indigenous people. Holland now takes a crucial role in the Biden administration's efforts to combat climate change and conserve nature. The Department of the Interior manages government relations with Native American communities. As secretary, Holland is responsible for sustaining public resources and wildlife, as well as overseeing millions of acres of public land and water. We spoke to an expert in Native American studies about the importance of this appointment. She has a deep understanding of uh, family, community, and culture and tradition. You know, that, that really formed the foundation for uh, Pueblo people and Pueblo life today. She'll be a teacher in the sense of teaching others, first of all, about the other side of the story, the Native story, and uh, also uh, about how we really have to begin to change our consciousness with regard to how we uh, address issues of land use, uh, issues of environmental degradation and human rights. I think she's a uh, uh, a very excellent uh, and eloquent uh, representative of that other voice in 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 the context of uh, the work that she will be doing as Secretary uh, of Interior. This afternoon, I spoke with a USC student who is a member of the same Pueblo tribe as Holland. So Paris, you actually work for ATVN on Tuesdays. You're the Director of Community Outreach at USC Native American Student Assembly and you happen to be part of Deb Hallen's Pueblo of Laguna tribe. How does it feel to hear the news of her confirmation? Yeah, it, it's super emotional for me and my family. Um, it feels like that's my auntie up there. It feels like that is a relative of mine. Um, and it's just super inspiring to see someone who does look like me and who does look like my auntie um, up there in that position of power. Um, especially in, in an institution that has brought so much pain and trauma to my community historically. So I think that's very powerful and it makes me just inspired to be able to bring my true authentic self into anything that I so choose to pursue. COVID-19 positive cases have decreased since this January, but anti-Asian hate incidents and crimes have not. I'm Shannon Gao reporting on campus from Studio T. This week, USC is holding several events to raise awareness and provide resources for students. According to the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at California State University, anti-Asian hate crimes increased nearly 150% in America's largest cities, 
while overall incidents dropped 7 percent in 2020. To address anti-Asian discrimination, USC has events this week to talk about the rising racism. I really want to make um, is actually that anti-Asian violence is not an Asian American problem. It is a racist, it is a race problem that we all need to um, we all need to find problematic with and want to combat. It's our responsibility to tell the truth, to provide a historical, cultural, social, political, economic context, to really lay the foundation and understanding of the root causes of, of where these different um, dynamics of racism and, and um, insidious xenophobia and um, bias and discrimination have been embedded and then and then what it is that we can do um, in everyday actions to really eradicate it. Comedian and actor Ronnie Chang will be at USC this weekend. The senior correspondent on The Daily Show will talk about anti-Asian racism and xenophobia and efforts to combat it. If you live in a college student-sized apartment like I do, you're probably rolling out of bed into your desk chair every day. But USC libraries are opening back up, so you might want to book an appointment. Definitely got a lot more work done than I normally do without distractions. I didn't pick up my phone, for example, and I do better when I'm surrounded by people that are also working. I was kind of more in the mindset of going to school, whereas when I'm in my apartment, it's kind of like as more like safe space or like you're in the mindset where like this is where you sleep, this is where you rest. There's a different collective energy that it is at libraries that you could never duplicate at your house. It's open to stimulation, the thing that you need to feel alive in, but it's not so distracting that you can't get what you actually need to get done. Levy Library is open Monday through Friday by appointment only. To book a spot, head to libcal.usc.edu. USC students might not have an official spring break, but many students are taking advantage of wellness days to hit the slopes. Lauren Turia reports from Jackson Hole, Wyoming on COVID protocols in ski country. As white powder flies here at the Snow King Summit in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, the pandemic has not slowed business on the slopes. Since the summer, the town continues to see higher lodging occupancy than years past. I feel like people are just like, you know what? tired of the situation, want to get away, so I feel like a lot more people are taking vacations. Throughout peak skiing months, Teton County remained the hardest hit with COVID cases in all of Wyoming. Despite increased signage, it's not easy to enforce masking up on the mountains. A lot of people are pretty conscientious about wearing their masks, but other people are not at all. So There's no really middle ground, it's either they will or they won't. At Snow King, this tends to be the popular consensus. After speaking with locals at the base, it seems like the signs may not be as effective as the town hopes. That's kind of difficult because I think everybody, you know, it, the, unfortunately it's kind of become like a political thing and like, right. like half the country's like whatever and the other half's like, let's make an effort to stop it. So the signs, I don't really think do anything. It kind of depends on you know, people's attitude towards it. And if they they think it, some people think it's just kind of like the flu, some people take it a little bit more seriously. And that's what I really think it's all about, you know? Varying COVID precautions and protocols are not uncommon here in Jackson. So if you're going out, mask up and shred that pow. Or if you're like me, you may just fall your way down the mountain. For Annenberg Media, I'm Lauren Teruya. I'm Nathan Ackerman, reporting from Alamo, California. And I'm Skylar Treppel, reporting from Winnipeg, Canada. Now, Skylar, why don't we first kick things off by talking about the USC women's soccer team. They went on an 0-2 mountain road trip, losing 2-0 to the Utah Utes on Friday, then falling 3-2 in overtime to the Colorado Buffaloes. They have a big matchup coming up with UCLA, the crosstown rival, on Thursday. But Skylar, what do you think it is that this Trojan team needs to turn around the most before that big matchup with the Bruins? You know, Nathan, I really think that they need to be able to convert on those penalty kicks because when you're given that opportunity in soccer, that's a great way to be able to put up points on the board. Also, they need to close the deal on the road before they go into overtime. 
This time they had a chance, but they left it up to chance once they went into overtime. So they're going to need to make the win happen before it gets to that point. However, I am going to give them some benefit of the doubt because they were playing in the snow after all. Yeah, and this team started the season ranked number 14 overall. They've now dropped to three and three on the year. But honestly, I think this team is just too talented with too many talented players not to turn around from this little rut that they're in right now. And Thursday against the Bruins will be a big test, one that I could definitely see them passing with flying colors. While the weekend was a swing and a miss for the USC soccer team, it was a home run for Trojan baseball. And of home runs, there were plenty on the way to a three-game sweep of Nevada at Dado Field. USC's biggest big fly was a walk-off two-run shot from redshirt junior right fielder Jamal O'Gwin on Saturday after the Trojans had let a 3-0 lead slip. The clutch blast was O'Gwin's first of two homers on the weekend and one of USC's six. This blast from freshman second baseman Nate Klo was the last of four Trojan homers on Sunday, their most in a game since May 2017. We were tougher outs at the plate. Uh, and I thought we grinded out at bats. We didn't score as many runs. The scoreboard maybe didn't reward us, but our at bats were a lot better than they had been in the previous three weeks. After starting off three games under 500, the strong weekend brought the Trojans to an even six and six record. I still think we're not going to hit our stride for about two to three more weeks. Uh, so we're going to have to grind it out in these early weeks in conference. But yeah, definitely momentum's good. USC will hit the road for three games at Washington next weekend. Welcome back to another edition of Skylar Swishes, where I give you the top plays from last week's action in the NBA. First up, we have Anthony Edwards launching off a trampoline before he throws down a dunk that is nasty and mean, right in Robert Covington's face as there was no saving grace. This is a candidate for dunk of the year, but Edwards isn't the only young star making noise as Chino Hills native LaMelo Ball looks like he's making NBA players his toys. It's the shot so nice, we have to see it twice as Ball hits the veteran-like pump fake, spin move, and the fadeaway swish. LaMelo's nickname may be Mello, but the original Mello is Carmelo Anthony, who passed Akeem Olajuwon for 11th all-time in scoring. With 26 points, this game was not boring, as Mello hit his patented mid-range jumper after a pump fake and spectacular footwork, showing he is a bucket-getting ex. So we've got Mellow Squared and a Dunk of the Year candidate too. That's all for Sports and Skylar Swishes as we dish it back to news. In honor of Women's History Month, we are highlighting women who inspire us. Annenberg Media's Maddie Gannon shares her mother's story of giving up her acting career to raise her family. Cooking in my mom's kitchen is always a performance. My mom, Lisa Gannon, has always been my superhero. But it wasn't until the last few years that I've realized how much of an impact that she's had on me as a woman. My mom moved to New York after college without knowing a soul. Lisa Gannon was never a famous actress, but she managed to support herself. She was in over a hundred commercials and was even a stand-in for Michelle Pfeiffer. In her mid-30s, she made the choice to stay at home to raise her kids. She always taught me that she was privileged to even have that choice because many families do not. Now she is on the board of the Boys and Girls Club of Hollywood. But as a teenager, I never understood why she would give up a career she loved to stay at home with her kids. Now I realize the beauty of my mom's decision was that it was fully her decision. She taught me women's equality is about empowering women to make their own choices. And she taught me women and all people move forward through respect and holding one another up rather than judging and tearing one another down. LA has moved into the less restrictive red tier this week as cases continue to fall in the county. Restaurants, gyms, and movie theaters are reopening on the one year anniversary of the first COVID-19 shutdown orders. The main reason, vaccinations. When the search for a vaccine began last year, no one could have predicted how quickly it would be developed. Before COVID, the fastest a vaccine had gone from sampling to approval was four years. The Pfizer vaccine was created in less than one year. Today, California has administered over 12 million doses, more than any other state. More than 20% of Californians have received at least one dose of the vaccine. 10% are fully vaccinated. The speed of which our vaccines were developed 
I consider that a scientific miracle, a major achievement that we've been able to um, develop a vaccine under such um, duress and in an incredibly short amount of time. There are many reasons um, why we were able to get to a vaccine as quickly as we were able to, some of which were we built upon the scientific foundation and research that was conducted in the last few years with other outbreaks, with the Ebola virus, the Zika virus, and other SARS viruses, um, as well as decades of research in cancer and HIV research to utilize that technology um, to develop the uh, technology that we're using now with the COVID-19 vaccines. Yeah, Cambry, it's so amazing to see how quickly these vaccines were rolled out. Um, I actually am lucky enough, I've gotten both vaccines already. I have both doses in me. You know, I'm feeling good. And it's definitely just nice to see that we're towards the end of this, hopefully, and that the more people get vaccinated, maybe we can continue to even open more things up. Absolutely. I'm so happy for you to know that you've received both doses and that you can say you're fully vaccinated. I personally have not had the privilege of being accepted into one of the tiers yet, but after conducting that interview today, I must say I feel a lot more comfortable and confident in how they were developed and also in the review process, of course. You know, you know as well as I do, you don't get to see every moment of an interview, but he was very intent on underlining for me the fact that just because these vaccines were approved and developed so quickly does not mean that any steps were skipped in making sure that they were safe, effective, and going to be something that could be trusted for the public to receive. So I definitely have a new sense of comfort and hope moving forward. And um, I'm looking forward to the day that I am qualified and can hopefully sign up to go to one of these vaccine sites near USC. Yeah, that definitely makes me feel good too. It's nice to know that they really were careful and made sure everything was exactly how it was supposed to be. Absolutely. That's it for Annenberg TV News. Thank you so much for watching. And from all of us at Annenberg Media, have a great night.